What do you do when you get fired from directing Guardians of the Galaxy 3? You go to the rival comic book company and dunk on every movie they have ever made previously. What's going on, everybody? It's time for Nerdy 430 podcast where comedian Tim Keck and I talk about nerdy things that we've seen lately. Uh, I'm Kevin Bauer, and today we are talking about The Suicide Squad in theaters and on HBO Max now. Tim, what did you think, man? This is the Suicide Squad, not to be confused with Suicide Squad, which quite frankly made me want to kill myself. The (laughs) Suicide Squad, on the other hand, was just a good time. This was a good fucking time it was fun they were making jokes they were blowing some brains out are there nits to pick sure we can be a little critical of this but i gotta tell you i just i just enjoyed a movie i i i sat down i opened up hbo max and i just enjoyed a movie and had a blast i laughed out loud this is just fun this was just fun kevin what do you think of it what a great fucking time dude this is just it's such a good ride. An incredible summer blockbuster. Obviously, the Dark Knight movies like Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises, they kind of they're in their own class of DC movies. I feel like we shouldn't even technically categorize them as DC movies because they're Christopher Nolan movies. But in the rest of the DC cinematic oeuvre, the Suicide Squad is so far and away the best thing that they've done. It's insane. It's a testament to how good James Gunn is that this movie is as good as it is. Okay, let's talk. Let's talk James Gunn, because I feel like you were a little out on James Gunn before this movie and you are all in back in on him. Can you can you give us your James Gunn beef? Okay, so here's the thing. I don't always love James Gunn's sense of humor. I think he has a tendency to have characters kind of comment on the world that they're in. I don't love that. I love uh, kind of keeping characters grounded in the in the reality that they're in. So not necessarily they don't all have to be super serious. But, you know, I kind of hate it when you have characters that are all commenting on like, wow, that's a really big gun when that line doesn't necessarily fit with the rest of their personality. I have a couple examples from this movie specifically. Guardians of the Galaxy walked the line really well for me guardians of the galaxy 2 way over the line they just took everything in that movie and ramped it up to 11 and i think it suffered i think all the worst parts of guardians of the galaxy 2 are ramping up like too much of that sense of humor that i don't necessarily care for um the really commenty shit so i've been cooled down on james gunn for a while you know everybody else has been ranting about how good he is i'm sitting back i'm being a critic They say he's doing the Suicide Squad. I'm like, yeah, we'll see. First one, disappointing movie. We'll see what he can do. He's got a huge cast of characters for it. I'm like, I don't know about this one. Uh, Pretty much from the get-go, this movie is a masterclass of cinematic efficiency. It's nuts. He establishes himself in here again as such a good director. He picks up these pieces that had been scattered I don't even know the expression for it. These pieces that had just been, I guess, left to rot in the first Suicide Squad and make something beautiful out of them. The Tim, the first Suicide Squad movie spends like the first 35 minutes setting the table for what the plot of a Suicide Squad is. This movie gets it done in like 90 seconds. It's awesome. That's one of the best. This is going to be my first. When did you know? When did you know you weren't watching your old the old Suicide Squad movie? When did you know you're watching a James Gunn movie? And you're right. That's like the first clue is that they summarize the entire thing in 90 seconds. You're a prisoner. You're a convict. I put a bomb in your brain. If you run away, we're going to blow you up, drop you off on an island. You got a mission. And like, boom, we're done. We got it. We know what this is. They have the benefit, (laughs) I guess. So long. (laughs) It took so long in the first movie. (laughs) It's because they felt like they needed to introduce us to this crazy idea, but I don't think we do. I mean, we're conditioned for the, I mean, this is also a sequel, so we have to give it the benefit of like the audiences, audiences are a little familiar with this. Like they know what the suicide squad is. I mean, the first movie was very successful, although critically, you know, terrible. It still made like $700 million, the box office. So people saw the first one, there was demand for the sequel. So people are familiar with the concept. We don't need to like dwell on it. But I still think if we were coming in cold, 
I'd get it. I'd get the idea because you know what? Then they drop us into a battle scene that they immediately demonstrate the idea in. We have all these convicts. They're expendable. A lot of them die immediately. One of them tries to run away. We blow up his brain. We got it. That's the movie. Like, that's everything we're going to get. And we've seen it. We've seen it demonstrated in the first 15 minutes. And we had a great time doing that. So it's it's masterful. It's masterful action, action movie, whatever, whatever it is. Filmmaking. I don't know what it is, but it's great. Dude, it was so good. The I mean, fucking hell. The scene with Idris Elba and Viola Davis where they successfully coerce Idris Elba into getting involved in the Suicide Squad and they are in Amanda Waller's office. I was thinking to myself while I was watching it, it ramps up so quickly. The whole scene is like, again, like 90 seconds long. But in the context of that scene, we get to a point where Idris Elba has a weapon to Amanda Waller's throat and everybody's screaming and shouting, but it's earned. They fucking earned it and they earned it that quickly and they rely on tropes a little bit for it, but in a really beautiful way. It was, it's just, it's such a fucking efficient movie. It's amazing. It's definitely relying on, I think I, I thought that was also a nod to the first one, right? Because they replace Will Smith who plays Deadshot, with Idris Elba blood sport. It's, you know, on the face of it, it's just replacing, you know, Will Smith with another actor, like another male black man who's also playing basically the same character that Will Smith did. How do you make them different? How do you make them original? And I think the plan initially was just for him to replace him as Deadshot and to not mm-hmm. change the like the formula with that. But the changes they made to Idris Elba's character were so good and so positive and made 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 that character so much more interesting. I don't even yeah, know who buddy. Bloodsport is. I don't think I've ever heard the name before. And I was like, I'm a Bloodsport guy now. Fuck Deadshot. Bloodsport's yeah. where it's at. <laughs> this guy rocks. And they do this like little nod to it where the, the the character motivation is basically the same. Idris Elba has a daughter and he's like, oh, my God, I keep got to keep my daughter safe. But he is a terrible father. Will yeah. Smith in the first one, they're playing all this stuff up like he's a sweetheart. He's taking his daughter for walks. He's buying her Christmas stuff. Idris Elba's like, I never wanted you. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to <laughs> be there. Your mom's a whore. She died in an alley and I'm glad she did. And all this stuff to this girl. And then Amanda Waller's like, I'll put her in prison. And that's when his like, I don't know. That's what it seems like he learns about himself with the way he reacts to that. So we've got the same Dude. motivation trying to save the daughter, but it's coming from a completely different place. It's earned differently. I love that. It, that was so unique. I really fucking loved it because I feel like, again, when you're playing on that kind of a trope, it always plays out the same way where it's like this really great father and he cares so much about his daughter. But when you see them fucking screaming at each other uh, in the I don't know what those are called, like the the call room of a prison, the visitor yeah. center at a prison. Um, knock on wood, I'll never need to find out, but, uh, Hey man, you'll be visiting me there soon enough. (laughs) Uh, the charge, the pod's too hot. (laughs) His podcast is too good. He's doing too much work. (laughs) Having them scream at each other, it made it in a weird way, a lot more authentic relationship because it's like, yeah, this isn't always like a syrupy, like, family drama oh we all love each other thing it's like families fucking fight and people say really horrible shit to family members but at the end of the day yeah they still have that family connection most of the time and we've talked about this i think maybe like with captain marvel or something like that where like we want our characters to fuck up we want them to be shit and then the heroic action is their evolution and pulling themselves out of shit Seeing yeah. Idris Elba be a huge asshole as a dad makes him more redeeming when he stands up for the daughter. It's probably like an abusive relationship, you know, like that, like that wouldn't be a healthy relationship in real life, right? Like, but Oh, yeah. No, it's it's good that there's glass between them. <laughs> Definitely good that there's glass between them. But as far as the movie is concerned, it makes this a more compelling character because ultimately these are bad guys. Even John Cena, who's like talking about peace at any cost. It's like, I all I want is peace. At and the at any cost is what makes him a bad guy, you know. So like, but all these characters, when you spend like alone time with them, you're like, oh, they're kind of good. Like they have good hearts, and then they start murdering people, and you're like, 
oh no, these are the bad guys. And we need, I think it did a good job of like reminding us that these are bad people. And we need that. And we it need that. It showed in this movie. us. It didn't tell us because the first movie showed spent us. so, there were so many lines in the first movie where they actively said, we're the bad guys. But we never really saw that happening. The worst that we saw was that Deadshot pulled a gun on Batman. Yeah. Which they made it look like self defense. As opposed yeah. to Deadshot, who is an assassin, maybe being hired to shoot Batman, maybe intentionally going after Batman because that was his job and that's what he did. And that's who the character was. So they really copped out some of that stuff. The other the other thing that made me think back to the when did you know this wasn't your your previous Suicide Squad. They don't send in. They just send in the bad guys. Only the bad guys, only the Suicide Squad are going on this mission. And I remember that being like the craziest mind fuck. And the first one is like Harley Quinn's going in with the military. Why? Yeah. What is this? What's the point of having a suicide squad if the U.S. Army is like marching with them? And really, is Harley yeah. Quinn going to help out Navy <laughs> SEALs? Is that really going <laughs> to help us? I thought the whole point was to do this operation off the books. So we see this first wave of guys go up the beach. It's all these like villains. And we see that they were all ultimately expendable. Amanda Waller was willing to part with all of them. And oh then we see the other God. beats. There's the real mission. And that what? first wave of guys, Tim. Yeah. When did you know that Michael Rooker Savant was going to die? Ooh, I would say once the action started, I knew he was going to die. I feel like I had a hunch when the movie started where I was like, this guy isn't in, he's not in the suicide squad. He's not like with the team because we haven't really seen anything in the trailers for it. It didn't, it didn't really make any sense. I'm not too familiar with Savant. I just didn't, I didn't picture him with the rest of the squad, but the way he reacted on the beach immediately, mm -hmm. like when he got there and he's not, everyone else is running around, like trying to fight and shit. He's just like camped there. I'm like, Oh, he's, he's going to run. Yeah. He's going to run and he's going to die because we needed that example. I was definitely looking for that on the beach, which is like. We have everyone going out to fight. This is the chance to demonstrate that the explosive works. We need that demonstration from somebody. He's the only person not trying to fight at all. He's the guy who's going to get his head blown up and then he starts swimming into the ocean. And I'm like, OK, this guy's fucking done. But Amanda Waller, the big bad in this movie, she's the ultimate villain of villains. Oh, my God. Let's talk about Viola Davis for a minute. Viola Davis is so fucking good. I am so happy that she got this movie because she crushed it in the entire first Suicide Squad movie, too. She's the highlight of the first Suicide Squad. Um, I'm thrilled that she's in a good Suicide Squad now so that more people can see and appreciate how good her Amanda Waller is. Because, I mean, it's an iconic character. It's incredible. Jesus Christ, she's amazing. You fully believe that she is willing to do fucking whatever it takes. There's that line where Steve Agee's like, hey, you wouldn't really have done that stuff to uh, Bloodsport's daughter. And she says something along the lines of like, you don't want to know what I'm capable of. And you fucking feel it. Like you really, it's not like an empty threat. Sometimes when like Samuel L. Jackson will say something as Nick Fury is like, whoa, that's a badass line. But also he's, he's Nick Fury. He's... He's got a good alignment, you know, he's not going to do anything crazy. Amanda Waller does some wild shit. It it feels very James Gunn to have the rest of the people that work for her disagree with her. Doesn't that feel like a James Gunn move? Like Definitely. she's the big bad, but ultimately the people that work for her, they're going to like knock her out and support the team and they're ultimately going to be good guys. That feels very James Gunn to me. Like the bad guy isn't really the bad guy. It's like this one evil. She he really just puts everything on Amanda Waller as like the one evil person. And even at the end of the movie, she doesn't punish the people that attacked her. So there's even like a note there of like she's not a I guess she is a monster, but she's a somewhat self-aware monster and that she recognizes that she was being a huge piece of shit that she's doing the evil thing. The question is, she probably doesn't care that she's doing the evil thing. That was a weird character moment. That was my only uh, like big beef with the movie was um, that was a really strange character moment in the first suicide squad. We see her when they're evacuating Amanda Waller from the like danger area. She kills all of the other people on her team that have been working with her in that like command center they set up because they weren't cleared 
to see the stuff that was happening around him, which is an incredible, again, fucking incredible character moment where we see that she really, truly is dedicated to the mission more than she's dedicated to any other human beings. Like she is cold, hard focused on the mission. And so to see her not take vengeance out on Steve Agee and the rest of that team was a little bit like, I don't know. I don't know that that fit all the way for me, unless they're just kind of acting like the first suicide squad didn't happen, which would be okay. It feels like they are. It feels like they are. Um, I mean, they named the sequel, the suicide squad. This feels like a reboot. This is a real like F you to, <laughs> to, to the previous movie, which was a piece of shit. Can we, let's get into beefs. Yeah. Cause I have a few. If we're oh, being really? nitpicky, I do. I mean, they're not, again, I, this isn't like normal beefs where I'm like, oh my God, this movie sucked. This is terrible. I had an awesome time, but definitely in retrospect, there were things where I'm like, eh, don't love Harley Quinn. Uh, I, I feel like there was a lot of filler with Harley Quinn. I think this movie yeah. did have filler moments and a lot of them I enjoyed because it was with the characters that I really liked. There were moments with Harley Quinn where I'm just like, I don't, she's by herself. I'm like, okay, cool. There's nothing happening. She like kills some guy and then she like does a monologue and it's like, okay, if you love Harley Quinn, then I guess you get to do this, but maybe I'm burned out on Harley Quinn or I really just want to see her interact with other people. Like I want to see her interact with these other characters. I like it felt like a conscious choice to separate her from as a more established character from the rest of the cast to give them time to cook. Right. We got time with Cena and Idris Elba, who both are thieves for me. Like they both just stole the show. And I thought their chemistry was great. We got time to see that and see that other team become a unit. And then Harley Quinn shows up and it's like, oh, OK. But it does. It never feels like Harley Quinn's a part of the team. It feels like, oh, there's the Suicide Squad and Harley Quinn's here. It's like if there was a Guardians of the Galaxy movie, it's like we got to get. I mean, we got to have Rocket Raccoon in there. Like, it's not the Guardians of the Galaxy without Rocket Raccoon. So I want her there. But by the same token, Lauren had the same note where it's like she didn't really. Most of her scenes didn't really matter. They could have been cut with no real consequence to the plot. She was on her own thing entirely. They actually have to take a diversion from the main plot of the movie to go rescue her from her side plot and bring her into the main plot of the movie. So like the scene, she gets some really cool shit. When she escapes from the prison, it's awesome. But again, we didn't really need to see any of the build up to it with the president or anything like that. We could have just, we would have understood if we saw her, you know, like bound in the prison escaping. Yeah, she got captured. We're good to go. That felt like filler to me. The plot is so concise that they need a way to like flush out the movie. It's, yeah. you we're dropping you on this island, blow up this place. And that's it. That's the whole plot. And there's no nuance in there. I mean, if you I mean, we always compare these movies to like John Wick or Taken or something like that. And the guy needs to find his daughter. He doesn't know where she is. So he has to go here. He's following a lead here. He's following a lead here. And there's none of that in this movie. So instead, we get these kind of like weird filler moments that aren't essential, but some of them are fun. And I don't know. They, the rescue, they botched the rescue, in my opinion, with Harley Quinn. By showing us that Harley Quinn had already gone out of the building. Yeah, I think if you show her just running into a room full of bad guys, cut to the guys outside rescuing her and then the guys about to climb the wall, they turn Harley Quinn's there. She's just covered in blood, holding the javelin like, are you guys trying to rescue me? Like, that's that's a joke. But this was. They they showed us the setup. They showed us the punchline before they said it. It was very weird. It was it I was a that. rare it was a rare gun botch. I feel like I love your take on that scene. I think that's a lot better way to do it. That honestly, my one so like the the Amanda Waller scene where she didn't murder everybody was a little bit of a beef for me. Uh, I think the only other big beef that I have is similar to what you just said, which is that this movie's too long. It's a little too long. You could shave. It's two hours and 13 minutes. You could shave probably 20 minutes off this movie and it's 
a fucking powerhouse. Like there's a the first scene I noticed where it slowed down was the scene where Polka Dot Man, they finally corner him and they're like, hey, is this contagious? You got to tell us what's going on. And he explains his powers. And then he explains that um, they ask, like, where his mom is. And he says everywhere. And we look around and see the entire cast. And they're like made up to look like his mom was CGI. And it's it's an okay moment. It played kind of flat in my theater. Nobody really like it didn't get a big laugh. It got a laugh, but it was the first moment that I really felt like broke the pace that the movie had because up until that point, it was fucking chugging. I was like, this movie is insane. And then that's the first moment that I thought I kind of stumbled later on. It pays off again because he envisioned Starro as a giant version of his mom. I think the joke plays the same in that Starro scene. I think if we cut the first mom scene with Polka Dot Man, we don't need a primer on how he got his powers. It's fun. The way they did his, the way they did his powers looks amazing. Like with the colors bubbling out of him, it looks super cool. But we'd be fine if we never got a full explanation for it. And then we would save the one part of that Polka Dot Man scene that worked, which is the joke of seeing somebody looking like his mom. We save that for the giant Starro version of the joke as a reveal and a scene that's inevitable because we already have Starro marching around. I think it makes the movie more efficient. And I think it pays off better at the end of the movie. What do you think? That, that might be better. I mean, I think that's probably a better joke. I, I don't know if I love Polka Dot Man. I don't know if I love this actor. It's just, he's just like so weird and like not fun to me. Mm. The best part, his best line was at the beginning when Idris Elba was like, we're all going to die. And he goes, I hope we do. I was like, this is awesome. I'm excited for this. But it doesn't. But I didn't I didn't have fun with him for the rest of the movie. I feel like it was cool. He's there and his powers are cool. But I didn't I wasn't excited to see Polka Dot Man do anything. The end when he dies like that's cool, too. When he's like, I'm I'm a superhero. It seems like he kind of it felt like a kind of forced arc. Or he's like finally being heroic and then they kill him. And it's like, we didn't really see an arc there. I mean, he's kind of been the same thing throughout. I don't know. It didn't feel it didn't feel earned. Could have had more payoff if it was like if we followed that thread of Idris Elba saying we're all going to die and him saying, I hope so. And follow the thread of him literally being suicidal through the rest of the movie. And then right yes. before he's killed by Starro, if he like is like, I love this. I do want to live. And then he's hit by Starro. <laughs> Like, I think in a way, it's almost a better arc. That's a better character. 100%. If he's actually suicidal, if he's actually trying to kill himself and maybe he saves his own life or for the first time he stops being suicidal to save somebody else. He saves like someone's in the street and he's like just standing there waiting to die. And then somebody else like needs help. And then he gives up his own like dying to save some. I don't know. There's there's stuff you could do with the idea of him being suicidal. Instead, all we got was mom issues, which. I think is f- interesting. I, I think your joke is way better, but it's also the only character development we get is him like looking at the crew. Everyone's his mom. He's dancing. Everyone's his mom. He sees the bad guy. It's his mom. So like he has a v- really disgusting relationship with his mom. His mom is the villain, but his vom- mom is also like a source of attraction to him. Wait, when he was dancing, everyone was his mom. Yeah, there's a scene where he's he's dancing and he sees everyone that he's dancing with as his mom. And so his mom's like grinding on him on grinding on him and stuff. I completely miss that. I completely miss the dancing scene there because he sees them. He sees the entire group as his mom. Then they go clubbing and he sees all the people he's dancing with as his mom. And then he sees the big bad as his mom. So that's like telling us that he has a really disturbing mother relationship. It's not just that his mom's evil. There's like. I mean, if he's, you know, partying and having a good time and all he sees is his mom, like this is a disgusting individual. So it's the only character development we get. Is it good character development? No, I don't think so. I would say that's a beef. Um, yeah, we can cut it. We can cut that. Both I would be happy the first to cut two it. mom scenes we cut. Um, I got two more beefs. Maybe beefs. I don't know if these are even beefs. OK. I'm not a fan of. Going back in time, any point, eight minutes earlier, three days earlier, I get it. But there's a great like Rick and Morty line that's basically basically just a quote from Dan Harmon being like, story should start where they start, not where they get interesting. (laughs) And I just every time I see that, I think that like it makes sense at the beginning of this movie because we're being introduced to a whole other team. So we get to open the movie with like they, they make sense. But. 
it's it always bums me out. I feel like we always have too much information to enjoy these flashbacks. I'm thinking like, oh, these people are still alive. Oh, this is still happening. Like, I'm just I'm just overthinking things as soon as we start flashing back. And it's not fun for me. Do you think the scene, the show off between Idris Elba and John Cena needed that? Because basically, if that was happening in real time, they would be going back and forth between the action that John Cena's doing and Idris Elba's doing, right? They'd be cutting from John Cena to Idris Elba to John Cena to Idris Elba. And what they do instead is they spend eight minutes with John Cena. Then they spend eight minutes with Idris Elba and they both meet at the same time when Idris Elba lands in front of John Cena as he's about to kill Mouse Catcher. It's an in, it's just an interesting directorial choice to instead of going back and forth, which I think is like what most action movies do to show like simultaneous action to show one series of events, go back in time, follow one person straight through, have them land together. I couldn't tell if I liked it or not. I don't know if this is a beef, but I I couldn't tell if I thought that was a great choice or weird. I personally didn't care for it. Uh, I I definitely respect that it was a choice that you made. Like, um, and especially, I mean, having had it happen at the beginning of the movie, it's it's definitely something that he wanted in the DNA of what this thing is. The first time it happens in the movie with the, I guess the A team that dies and the B team comes through, works great. Like it works super well in the beginning of the movie, but also that's when the pace is slower at the beginning of the movie. And it works as like a, the scene with the A team dying works as like a thesis statement for the whole rest of the movie. So it totally checks out when it happens in the climax, it really slows down the pacing. And that's another situation where it's like, it was so, I feel like the first like 40 minutes of this movie, I haven't seen very many movies that move at such a good pace. And then the first time the slowdown happens, you really feel it. And I feel like there's a way to recut this movie to, uh, maintain that same pace the whole time through and i feel like it would feel like you just got off a roller coaster ride by the end like it's it is amazing and i hate that we kind of slowed it down at the very end of the movie we're definitely picking nits here this movie is so fucking fun but i i totally agree with you on that one. it is super fun i mean james gunn's a master of what he does i think this movie felt super different from guardians and just that he just made he made choices in this movie maybe it was just to make it feel different than guardians but he made choices that I think are weird. I don't know if they're I guess I don't know if that's a beef. It was it just stood it stood out to me as a distinct action movie choice that is different than than the norm. This one's a beef that kind of leads into a thief. I don't like flag. I didn't like him in the first movie. Maybe he's just a remnant of the movie, but he's just kind of a dud character. He's not fun. He's not interesting. I get that in the comic books. I think he is the leader of the suicide squad and he's like a military guy. So he is a if you're a suicide squad diehard, he's an interesting character. I'm saying this leads into a thief because John Cena stole the fucking show for me. John oh Cena God. is incredible. This guy is a superstar. He's an action star. He's yep. the Arnold Schwarzenegger of our generation. Watch out the rock because John Cena is coming and John Cena. Sorry, Dwayne can act. I don't yeah. <laughs> John, John Cena can fucking act and he's not uh, like the most he's not going to win any Oscars, but he's great at what he does and he crushes it. And I was rooting for John Cena to kill flag. And I don't know if that's what they want. I don't know if that's like a good thing, but I was like, flag sucks. Get him out of here. Go John Cena. Murder his ass. Well, let me clarify. <laughs> and- that's absolutely not what they want. But <laughs> <laughs> he's just so fucking charismatic. He was my first thief too. It's it's unbelievable. And he's getting a spin-off show, which is great. It's like an eight episode spin-off on HBO Max. Yes. Um called what fuck it's the peacemaker show or something. Yeah, it's something like that. It's super interesting because when he died in this movie, I was like, fuck, that was gonna be a beef where I'm like, fuck, <laughs> you killed him off. This is the best thing that came out of this movie. John Cena's God. Peacemaker is is the movie. So you guys fucked yourselves over by killing it over, and then it's like, okay. He's getting his own TV show. Don't know if I'm excited about the TV show necessarily. It sounds like James Gunn wrote most of it. He's producing yeah. it. So it could be very good. I'm kind of optimistic, but it's it's so good that he didn't die. It's great that he didn't die because he's did you, he's amazing. Did you stay for the post credits? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just watching on HBO and it just kept going. Oh, gotcha. OK, so, yeah, you did <laughs> see the post credit scene where he's in the hospital. 
Yeah, I saw the post credit okay. scene where he's in the hospital um, and they're talking about bringing him back. And I guess those actors that were there watching him are going to be in the show, too. So I think initially people were talking about it being a prequel, the TV show. But I think it will pick up where Suicide Squad left off. Maybe we're jumping the gun on reckless speculation, but thief. John Cena is a thief, a thief. Absolutely. And a half. I got another thief for you. Oh, the the Chirons for transitioning. I don't know what you call them, like the text that establishes where you are. Uh, I'm assuming a Chiron. Holy shit. He did such a cool job. The best one is the forced perspective trick with Jotunheim where it says Jotunheim and then the camera pans up and it's just a bunch of shit on a rooftop. I mean, that was so goddamn cool. I thought that was that was another choice. It felt like he made that was like, this isn't Guardians. This is a different thing. It shows you how much work went into this movie, like how prepared they were to be able to do stuff like that. I it's I don't, it's really goddamn cool. I dug it. I thought it was great. Can we talk Idris Elba too? Please. He is awesome. He's so cool, man. That's gotta be like the, one of the coolest dudes alive. Just the coolest, coolest men in the world. That guy is awesome. His character. Uh, we talked about it up top. How it's kind of a rip off of Deadshot, but like his costume Oh, so cool. His co- and he's just ripping the whole time. He's just ripping things off of his costume that turn into weapons. And one's a slingshot. One's like a, a jet, like a blow dart or whatever. The f- I don't even know what it was. He had a sword. He had these weird guns that morphed at the end of the movie. He keeps putting more and more things and building a giant gun. that He shoots the starfish dude with the that costume was, so was out of this world. It was so cool. And it really separated him from Deadshot. And there's a scene at the end of the movie where he's ran all- out of all of his gadgets and at no point during the movie did I think he could run out of gadgets. And, and that moment hit for me, like at the end of the movie, when he's like on his last, he's like barely, he's like, oh my God, I'm going to die. And he's checking his entire costume for like anything. Do I have anything? I'm like, I can use anything as a weapon and I have nothing. I was like, that's awesome. That's so cool because it felt like he just had an unlimited resource of just, you know, he rips off a piece of clothing and it's something cool. But like, I don't know, the gadgets were awesome. Dude, it was so sick. They did. I, they did him so well and he stood he worked so well as like a more grounded character in this one than um i feel like if you had if you had brought uh deadshot back will smith brings a little bit more levity into the role i think it could have been really interesting to see what this would have looked like with deadshot again instead of with bloodsport those names are so similar they're not but they're identical um, yeah so like I keep almost getting them confused. It would have been interesting to see the lighter tone from Will Smith, especially with James Gunn, if they would have gotten more joke opportunities out of there. But also the gravity that Idris Elba brings is, I mean, he's just, he's just a fucking force. He's like Viola Davis. It's like you you get these great actors and you put them in something and they're going to elevate the source material. He, he has gravity where like he can just stand there and it's just like the eyes drawn to him. It seems like the rest of the movie revolves around him. I mean, and and that's how that and he put Cena over for me because like to use a wrestling term, he put Cena over because their chemistry, I thought, was awesome. It was so good. I'm like, you don't just get that. Like Cena's Cena's acting. He's he's doing a good job acting. And he's doing a great job, like playing off of Elba. He doesn't like he didn't Elba didn't blow him off the screen or anything like that. I don't know if that's really Elba's move because he is like just more even keel than a lot of these people. But I thought John Cena looked natural next to him. And the scene where they wipe out the whole village and then it turns out they killed all the freedom fighters is is one of the best things I've ever seen. It's so awesome. They're all using their gadgets. Him and Peacekeeper, Peacemaker are just using, doing a little back and forth. The scene where Cena like jumps on the roof and he's just blow darting people from like 50 yards away. I was like, this is the coolest scene in, in any DC movie. I think that I've seen. It's a legit classic. It's so good. It's like, I, oh my God, I'm, I'm still kind of in shock that this is as good as it is. I mean, it's awesome. That scene was so good. It was so awesome. Oh my God. I thought some of the comedy was on point in this too. Maybe it was my last sure. thief was like, that was another great thing. Like the whole thing with the weasel, I thought was, was kind of funny <laughs> <laughs> where they dropped the weasel out of the plane and he drowns immediately. And they're like, did anybody check to see if the weasel could swim? And it's like, okay, so this is, 
this is James Gunn. It felt like James Gunn. It's like Amanda Waller is like not perfect. You know, I think there's this idea that Amanda Waller is this has Batman like intellect where her superpowers. I already thought of that. Like that's Amanda Waller to some extent. And in this movie, she doesn't. She's not on top of everything. She's evil. She's undermined by her crew. She doesn't see that coming. She's a more flawed character, which I don't know if that makes it more interesting or better or whatever. But the recurring gag of not having done their research on the Suicide Squad is funny. And it makes sense in a different way. It doesn't make sense for the first movie, but it makes sense in the idea that these are expendable people. They're yeah, they're criminals. We just grabbed the most badass criminals we could threw them on this island. So and so is afraid of rats. Like, who cares? Like, figure it out or you die. You know, why do we care if he's afraid of rats? Weasel can't swim. Fuck it. We don't need Weasel anymore. You know, like yeah. that's what they think Weasel was going to do anyway. I'm glad he's alive too. the Weasel spinoff show that they're working on. Cannot wait for it, dude. It's going to be nuts. They got Scorsese. They did. They, they nabbed the big dog, the big weasel, so to speak. And I think, you know, he's <laughs> quoted about like, I don't know, whatever. He's done a lot of work in his past. Leo's going to be on board. I think this is going to be good. Jonah Hill's coming off the bench again to, uh, to crush it in the weasel movie. He was talking to uh, Deadline Hollywood, and uh, I think the exact quote was that he views the Weasel series as a spiritual successor to Taxi Driver. <laughs> um, I, got a, I, got I mean, a I do for sure. Out. Yeah, thief shout out. I'm going to do two quick thief shout outs. One is to Ratcatcher 2. Uh, I just looked her up on IMDb. I guess her name's Daniela Melchior. She did such a good job of walking that line. I feel like it happens so frequently where you will have a female protagonist in a movie and they will be their thing will be that they have heart in like the Captain Planet sense. Their power is heart. And she's like, she's just so empathetic and she cares for everyone. And she did in a way in this movie that was not obnoxious. It was not over the top. You just genuinely believed that she was a really good person. And she really, truly cared for people. Uh, and despite the fact that she looked like a manic pixie dream girl, she did not bring any of that energy to it. She was just like a, a fun character to root for. Uh, I really felt for her. I felt for her backstory with Taika Waititi. It was great. Who wouldn't miss having Taika Waititi for a father? It's just super relatable. She's awesome. She's so good. It's nice in this movie that we get a moment where she's like damsel in distress needs to be saved. But at the end of the movie proves to be the strongest one and saves everybody. You know, Elba saves her. She saves Elba. And what feels at the end of the day like, oh, these are equals. She is she is an equal of all these people. Her empathy is a strength, not a weakness. Yep. Um, love that. And then another shout out to uh, my personal favorite person to have ever played the doctor peter capaldi i mean wow my only beef with peter capaldi's character he played the thinker my only beef with peter capaldi is that we didn't get more there was a lot there we barely scratched the surface this guy fuck he's so good at that role he shines so much in roles where he is exposing the horrors that everybody else doesn't want to talk about i think they could have pushed it more for me I wasn't as excited about that guy. I'll be honest. I didn't feel I didn't feel much for him. I think I like the idea of it. I like the idea of it being more fucked up and the reveals about the star monster and all this stuff and like how they're feeding stuff to him. I liked all of that. I would have loved to see that character be like a little more crazy and like been pushed a little bit farther. Maybe. I don't know. I thought the situation was more disgusting or disturbing than the actor was, if that makes sense. Maybe that's just picking nits. I thought he was cool, but I wasn't, I was not, I did not have the feeling you did of like, we need more thinker. I was like, I kind of wanted the thinker to do more. I wanted the thinker to like be more messed up. I wanted him to, I don't know, outsmart anybody. Yeah. Which I guess is not what the thinker does. (laughs) I guess what the thinker does is take a long ass time to look at a starfish. Like (laughs) he's been doing it for 30 years. Like how smart is this guy that he's been 30 years with this starfish? (laughs) Before we get to reckless speculation, what do you think about the starfish, the big bad? I would say one of my least favorite things about the first Suicide Squad is that they end up fighting a like magic at the end. And I'm thinking Harley Quinn with a baseball bat. Why is she battling magic? I don't think I didn't feel that way about the giant star monster for some reason. And I'm trying to figure out why, why I wasn't completely you know, shook by the idea of 
Idris Elba fighting a giant star monster. It kind of worked. It worked for me, but I'm not sure why. I'll tell you why. It's because the star monster was a character and the magic in the first movie was just a weird CGI special effect. The star monster, we saw all of like the it was a it was a villain because, you know, it's a it's a force of nature. It's like Jaws. It's doing things. It's going out. It's ending people's lives for its own benefit. But by the same token, it's been wronged for 30 years by the thinker. Like the thinker has been effectively torturing it for 30 years while it just grows to this massive size. So when we see it burst out and we see it start pooping more little star babies and taking over more people's lives, we feel for the people on this island who are being eaten by this star thing. But then we also feel for the star thing when it shouts through the people's like mouths and the telepathic link at the end that it was happy when it was drifting through space and looking at the stars. Yes. You feel remorse, but also by the same token, it's like it it does. It feels like a shark that got past a shark net and started eating surfers. And you're like, ah, oh, buddy, I'm sorry. We got to put you down. Yeah, that's a great point. You you feel empathy for this thing and it is a tangible thing. It's not a concept like magic. Like this is something that bleeds. This is something you can kill. And this is something that is some is more human, it seems like in a way. Yeah. I just wish my only my only wish with it is that they hadn't shown any of it in the trailer, because I think if that had been a surprise in the movie, I would have lost my mind. I just knew it was coming because I'd seen it. They showed the giant star monster and all that. I feel the same way with I still think about this with the Hulk reveal and Thor Ragnarok. They didn't need to show us that the Hulk was in the movie. Like if we just shown up and the Hulk showed up, the theater would have gone nuts. But I don't know. They they spoil these big reveals. I hate trailers. I'm a, I mean, I love trailers. If it's a movie, I'm not going to see. But if it's a movie, I'm going to see. Fuck it. I don't want to know. I don't want to watch these trailers. I don't want to watch Thor Ragnarok trailer. I'm going to see it. They're only going to ruin stuff for me. Trailers don't care. Do you remember hearing the um the get out the story about get out like that trailer? We should. Yeah. I don't know why I'm talking about this in the pod. There was a story with Jordan Peele and get out where uh, spoiler alert for get out. Fast forward 30 seconds. Do you find out that the girl that his girlfriend actually betrayed him? And there's that scene where she's looking for the keys and then she takes the keys out and she's like, F you, you know, mm -hmm. like this was a joke. They wanted to put that in the trailer and he had to apparently like scratch and claw and fight to get them to keep that out of the trailer. But that's like the whole twist of the movie. <laughs> So and in their minds, they're like the people making Jesus. trailers are like, we should put this in the trailer. But like no one with common sense who's actually going to watch this thing would ever think to put that in the trailer. So it just it was just a great example of how like the trailer industry is about. I mean, the goal is to take your money and trailers generate take your money when they, they don't care about whether or not you're actually going to enjoy the movie. <laughs> I mean, there's a, a whole subgenre of trailer that shows you the entire movie in two minutes. Yeah. Which sucks. And now there's the shit where they show you the trailer before they show you the trailer. The first three seconds of any trailer now is the trailer. And then it shows you the production company logo and you see the trailer again. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm very anti trailer. Dude, big trailer has gotten out of control. <laughs> Dude, we got to end big trailer. Hopefully the death of movie theaters will <laughs> will bring about the death of movie. Trail. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, trailer's going to get me to go see uh, Snake Eyes, but I ain't watching that Shang-Chi trailer. I'll tell you that. I keep I keep Hell finding yeah, out stuff, but I'm I'm going to go see that movie. I'll be there in the theater. I'm ready for it. I don't need to spoil anything. I'm going to I'll tell you right now. I'm going to do everything in my power to not watch the trailer for Spider-Man No Way Home. I'm not. I heard I heard I saw people on TikTok like check this out immediately. I'm swiping like how do I block this? How do I block Spider-Man No Way Home from everything? I feel like I know too much about it already. I'm just going to do the first Spider-Man movie with the first Spider-Man movie with Michael Keaton. They show the whole like Coney Island scene in the trailer. And I was mm -hmm. watching the movie and I was like, there's no way this is the final scene. I've already seen it. And then it was. And I was like, I'm never watching a trailer again. This is <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> OK, after that aside, ready for reckless speculation? Absolutely. OK. Normally, we recklessly speculate on like what's next for the movie. I'd like to pose this question. What's next for James Gunn? Because with this, maybe this is me projecting a lot. But 
the setup for this, this, the story of how he got the suicide squad is that some tweets were unearthed from his past where he made some, you know, pretty gross jokes. We don't need to get into that. And Disney fired him because they said, you're, you know, we don't find this language acceptable. The entire Guardians of the Galaxy cast signed a letter basically to Disney and said, if you fire James Gunn, we all quit. And they stood by their director and like a in a crazy show of support, which I thought was kind of cool, whether or not you think he should have been fired or whatever. He's, he's working. He's brilliant. The cast, you know, loves him. So they want him back. So James Gunn essentially fired for a week, two weeks. It was a very short period of time that he was fired. Immediately, DC swoops in, gives him suicide squad. Then Disney comes back. He signs on for Guardians of the Galaxy 3 and like the Christmas special or whatever. So now we have Guardians of the Galaxy 3 getting pushed out. So James Gunn can do Suicide Squad because Disney fucked up because they're a bunch of assholes. This is me projecting now. DC, in my mind, came to James Gunn and said, here's Suicide Squad. Do whatever you want. It's R. You can kill whoever you want. You can't kill John (laughs) Cena. You can't kill Idris Elba and you can't kill Harley Quinn. Go for it. Dude, I and, real quick, I it took me probably two minutes into the movie to be like, oh shit, this is rated R, isn't it? <laughs> it was like the movie started and then the first couple of kills happened, and I was like, oh, I thought I came to a PG 13 movie. Oh yeah, they like blow Pete Davidson's face off, which is like <laughs> I think is great awareness. It's like how people love watching Logan Paul get like beat up in boxing matches. It's like, yeah, I would love to watch Pete Davidson get shot. I'd pay money oh, to God. see that. Sure. Bad take. <laughs> sure. This is a bad take. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing him get get fucked up in a movie that's fake. It's satisfying. It's gratifying to watch. I think I can't be the only person who resents Pete Davidson there. Let's get uh, Colin Jost in the next Suicide Squad. Can we just have his character (laughs) ripped in half in the next movie? Well, that should be the Suicide Squad. It should be just getting like the least likable, like the douchiest celebrities and just killing them off in the first 30 seconds. That's my reckless speculation for the sequel. It's just going to be full of just like the, the lamest people in Hollywood. Oh, my God. That'd be so funny. Here's here's my James Gunn question, though. If you had ultimate freedom with the Suicide Squad, which I'm you know, projecting he did, how do you go back to Guardians? How do you go back to the mouse? How do you go back to Disney? I don't think the Guardians movies feel restricted, but PG-13 is definitely definitely restricting. And we know that Marvel has rules on what you can and can't do. You know, they tried killing off somebody in a movie. They brought him right back. They you know, the cast is the cast. People aren't as expendable as you want them to be. You have to follow a story. It's going somewhere probably with Marvel. Are we going to be getting more suicide squads? Are we going to be seeing him do more stuff with Marvel? What's going to happen for James Gunn? Because in my mind, there's no suicide squad without James Gunn. (laughs) I think, yeah, I think it's going to be really difficult for DC to find anyone to replace him for the third one. I do think. I think they're going to try. I think they definitely want him to come back and do Suicide Squad 3 or The Suicide Squad 2, whichever way they decide to name it. (laughs) These The Suicide Squad 2 is so passive aggressive and I love it. That would be phenomenal. I think he's done with Guardians for sure. I don't know if that's been confirmed or not. I would be shocked if he signed on to do a fourth Guardians movie. Uh, It feels like three in the Christmas special are probably going to close out what he wants to do there. And I think you're I think you're exactly right with the restraints. Um, This is the first time that he's had a budget like that. And just the gloves have been completely off. It's got to be really compelling. The only way that I could really see him going forward with Marvel after this is if they gave him X-Men. If they gave him another property with like a ton of characters or like even if not x-men there's no this is such a fucking pipe dream but if they did like this kind of felt like an ecstatics movie i don't know if you've ever read uh ecstatics but it's really high fatality rate a lot of really weird people with really weird powers and kind of like a meta text over top of the entire thing about like bigger issues with the world and people doing biddings for governments that don't care about them and use them as pawns so I could see him taking on one of the weirder X titles or something like that, maybe even further down the line after mutants are established, because I don't know if they're going to want to go too wild with introducing X-Men in general. But mutants feel like they were kind of made for James Gunn. You don't need to waste time on origin stories or anything. You just get to play with people with really funky superpowers. Do you think he wants to do superhero movies anymore? 
I think he'd do. I think if you asked him right now, I think Guardians of the Galaxy is like already in process, progress and all that stuff. I think if you asked him today, obviously, I have no I mean, I was texting about him about it with him today. Right. Um, so I've kind of got I mean, I'm not going to like, you know, out him or whatever, but, you know, sure. I think if you asked James Gunn today, if you could make more Guardians movies or make a Suicide Squad 2, he's going Suicide Squad 2. Yeah, I think you're probably right. And if you were like, hey, would you want to make another PG-13 movie? No, I'm going to stick with R. I love the ecstatic idea. I mean, that's like we're talking about a decade from now. They introduce the X-Men and then they start doing like X-Men spinoffs that are like I can see ecstatic being or like an X-Force movie being the Suicide Squad of of Marvel if they want to go that route, which they really haven't. But if if Daredevil's an R, R sorry, if Deadpool is an R for Marvel, Maybe that cracks the door open for this, or maybe they just stick with what they're good at because and let DC have this. I mean, this is the best DC movie they've done <laughs> in yeah. their universe. So I don't know. Maybe let them have this. Let DC have this like really dark stuff. You've got Deadpool now. Let them have it. And I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm excited for whatever James Gunn puts out now. I'm there. He's the best at what he does, which is these big ensemble things. He's great. He's so good. Yeah. Any final thoughts, Kevin? No. Uh, if somehow you haven't seen this movie, see it. It's worth it. This is a really good time. Just a really, really good time. This is just a fun movie. You know, we went to go see Green Knight the other day. Why the fuck am I watching Green Knight when I can see Suicide Squad? I'm done with good movies, Kevin. Nothing but Suicide <laughs> Squads for me from here on out. Anytime someone's like, oh, it's a great. It's a, anytime someone's like, oh, it's a film. It's like, fuck your film. I want to watch a movie. Okay, I want it on <laughs> HBO Max. This is awesome. This is just a good time. This is a fun movie. I mean, these are the kind of this is one of the first movies we've both been excited about on the pod. It was such a good time. Enjoy it. So that's the Suicide Squad. Nerdy for 30. Kevin, this was fun. Thank you all for listening so much. Uh, please like and subscribe if you can. If you're on Apple, five stars, five stars. Hit that like button. Leave us a funny comment. If it's good, we'll uh, we'll read it on the pod or something, maybe. Uh and yeah, no uh, promises no promises we're trying to I'd make like it to, good maybe we do another pod where we read com- i mean i want comments if you if you come up with a comic we'll do something fun with a comment and uh that's it from us next week we're doing fear street and that's the plan hell yeah stay nerdy <laughs> stay nerdy <laughs> bye <laughs>